Well, welcome back to our study on Ruth. And as we left off last week on kind of a cliffhanger where Naomi tells Ruth to wait because the matter will be taken care of today, we've gotten to that point where the matter is going to be taken care of. And these verses, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, are the climax of of the book. This is what the book has been building towards as God has been orchestrating these events throughout the story. This is the moment where we see the plan fall into place. Now, if you remember from chapter three, Ruth had gone to Boaz and proposed to him. She proposed marriage to him. And even though that was countercultural, being a woman of worthy character and Boaz being attracted to that, he agreed. But there was a problem. Just like there is in any great love story, there's a problem. And that problem exists in a closer redeemer to the land and the family of Naomi. And so Boaz has to talk and deal with that redeemer. Now, <clears throat> in any transactional conversation, you never want to lead with exactly what you want. And Boaz, being a man of business, knows this. And we're going to see this kind of masterful sales tactic that Boaz uses in these verses to kind of get what he wants out of the entire conversation. And I'm excited to read that for you. So we're going to pick up in Ruth 4. Verses 1 through 12. And this is the very next day after the threshing floor scene took place. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then they said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. It's a very simple Proclamation by Boaz. Hey, Redeemer, come here real quick. Sit down. All you guys over here, come sit down as well. I don't know if you're aware, Redeemer, but there is a parcel of land that's being sold by our relative Naomi that belonged to our relative Elimelech, and you are first in line to redeem it. So if you'll redeem it, redeem it. If not, let me know because I'll redeem it, right? We're focusing on the land. So then he goes on and he says, the Redeemer says, I will redeem it. And then Boaz, kind of burying the lead, says this. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also, by the way, will require or acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. You want to talk about burying the lead. You want to talk about not leading with what you necessarily want. Boaz masterfully crafts this conversation. Hey, there's land to be bought. Will you redeem it? Yeah, I'll redeem it. Oh, by the way, if you redeem that land, you also will acquire Ruth the Moabite, a foreigner, who will be your wife, and you'll need to carry on the name of the dead. Well, let's see how the Redeemer responds. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, one drew off his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have brought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought her 
to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in this inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephathra and be renowned in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this woman. We have the climax of the story. We have a situation where, according to Naomi, Boaz would take care of it that day. And guess what? Boaz took care of it that day. When he met with the Redeemer, he gave him an opportunity to redeem the land. To be that kinsman redeemer that would take the land of Elimelech and not let it be parceled off to other clans and other families, but could then keep it within the family for that generational perpetuity. He gave him that opportunity, and it sounded like a great deal. The redeemer was all in when all that was required was redeeming the land. But then Boaz says, by the way, If you've acquired the land, then you've also acquired Ruth the Moabite, who you will need to marry and you will need to bear a son so that the name of Malon and Elimelech can continue. Well, that's the stopping point for the Redeemer. He's like, I can't do that. I have other kids. I have other people who share in that inheritance. I can't divide it by another share. And in the Redeemer, we don't know the Redeemer's name, but when you look at this, he's looking at this completely from a personal standpoint. This is all about his monetary gain. He was all in when it was only a field that could fill his coffers with more field to harvest and work and sell grain. But when it came to splitting that inheritance, he was not interested which perfectly paved the way for Boaz to fulfill his duty as the kinsman redeemer and commit to a Levite marriage that left Elimelech's legacy to carry on. And in this moment, it is incredible to see the humility with which Boaz operates. He knows that this son that is born to him in Ruth will not carry his name, but will carry Elimelech's name. Yet he's willing to do it because of the love and the care that he has for Ruth, and because of the honor and integrity that is apparent in his life. And if you want to see God orchestrating, and you want to see how God uses the messy lives of people to create a beautiful mosaic through his sovereignty, look at the names that are referenced by the elders of the town. It's important that this transaction happened in front of witnesses because then it's one person's word against another. But there are 10 people here at the town gate, which is kind of like a town hall, that witness this transaction. And their response after Boaz says, I have acquired the land, you are all witnesses, but I have also acquired Ruth to be my wife so that I may uh, perpetuate the legacy of the dead. And their response was, may the Lord... Be with this woman and make this woman coming into your house like Rachel and like Leah. Referencing back to the, the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel. Where Rachel and Leah's wombs were opened and closed by the sovereign hand of God. Leah would bear a son while Rachel's womb was closed. Leah's womb would be closed while Rachel's was open and bearing other sons to Jacob. And you see how for 10 years in in chapter 1, we understand that the womb of Ruth was closed. There would be no reason to introduce Boaz if Malon and Ruth had been able to conceive a child, but they weren't. Because the hand of God is orchestrating this story for a specific purpose, as we'll get to and building towards the end of the book. The other thing that is referenced here is Tamar and Perez and Judah. 
And we talked about this a little bit in chapter one, but the messiness through which the line of Judah was created, where uh, Tamar seduces Judah to produce Perez and ultimately create this lineage that's going to be very significant in ancient times. You can see the way that these broken and messy pieces of a mosaic are being put together. And it's going to be clearly seen when we get to the last part of chapter four, because there is an ultimate purpose in this book. There is an ultimate ending for this book, and we are going to get to that at the end. But what we want to focus on right now is this redemption that is seen through Boaz. Boaz is the redeemer. He is a type of Christ figure that takes those born into sin, those foreigners, those otherness, and through his kindness and through his love and through his care, brings them into his house and makes them part of his family. This makes me think of the, the, the various times in Paul's writings where Paul tells us that we are no longer what we were in the past, but we are now adopted sons and daughters of God. That God, through his infinite mercy, has chosen us through adoption to be part of his family. He's redeemed us. He's made us part of his family in the same way that Boaz chose Ruth and made a transaction to make her part of his family, redeeming the land, fulfilling that financial need that her and Naomi have, but not only that, taking it a step further and agreeing to marry her, to carry on the legacy of Malon and Elimelech, giving Naomi that need for family and fulfilling that for her as well. And so now the transaction has been taken care of. As Naomi told Ruth, don't worry, my daughter, it will be taken care of today. She knew Boaz was a man of action. And guess what? Maybe at the same time Ruth and Naomi were having their conversation at the end of chapter 3, Boaz and the Redeemer were having their conversation at the, the city gate. He was taking care of it, and he did take care of it. And now the, pay, the, the path has been cleared for Boaz and for Ruth's love story to continue. And we're going to get to the culmination of that love story next week. <laughs>